This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. Jesus of Nazareth declared, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The philosopher Calvin Wingert has written, No one can really give thanks unless within his heart he deeply feels that undeserved blessings have been bestowed upon him. Our great wrong is our carefree assumption that we rightfully deserve what God has given us and that we are free, therefore, to do with it what we please. We are rather trustees of this earth and of all that it holds. One of the stories told by the late Ernest Thompson Seton, America's great naturalist, storyteller, and wildlife artist, was this one. He said, when I first came out west, I visited a Sioux tribe of Indians in Dakota. They killed a buffalo and made a great feast. As I watched the buffalo being prepared, I saw one Indian woman cut a piece of buffalo meat and drop it into the fire, but I asked about her action. It was a religious act, she said. She was asking a blessing, saying, Great Spirit, we thank thee for thy bounty, and we ask you to partake it with us. However you may express or symbolize it, let thankfulness and worship of God be the very heartbeat of your spiritual life. Praise and worship are essential to vital and deep religion. Most people say thanks to hotel doormen and restaurant waiters more often than they do to the living God. Probably the average unthinking man or woman feels more genuine, deep gratitude to his or her employer for a $30 a week raise than to the living God for existence, for life itself. There is something grotesque about that. When we get the notion that the most meaningful and momentous matters are the merely material and disregard the cravings of our souls for something there is within you which longs to praise and worship God. Is your very concept of God commensurate with the universe? Is it truly magnificent or merely minuscule? Do you conceive of God as being sufficiently great really to manage this universe? Too many men and women bear in their minds... The idea of a deity dwarfed by the expanses of physical creation, a god bewildered by the modern age, a god they fear to be in awe of humankind's scientific works and probably astounded by current technology. Most, when they conceive of God, likely imagine him to be in imminent danger of losing his celestial sovereignty to the scientific prowess of 21st century civilization, as if God would be utterly impotent to fathom or govern a universe as complex as ours. Yet, quite to the contrary, God is omnipotent and omniscient. With a plenitude of power and understanding, God reigns supreme in wisdom, might, and righteousness. But be honest with yourself. Probably, the average person listening to me talking about God on the radio is imagining in his or her mind a God who could not even begin to understand radio, a god who would be baffled by the scientific erudition of a freshman physics student, a god as anachronous in this modern time as a sundial on a satellite, but hardly so, not so at all, for the mind of God is utterly without limit, as is God's love for you. Respond to that love with worship, praise, and with thanksgiving. A man who bows down to nothing, wrote Dostoevsky, can never bear the burden of himself. And Oliver Wendell Holmes said, I have in my heart a small, shy plant called reverence. I cultivate it when I worship. Dare to say with the great physicist Sir Isaac Newton, Glory be to God, who has allowed me to catch a glimpse of his garments. Somebody said to me one time, Most people think of religion as a conglomeration of inaccessible abstrusities. So they do. But the ringing message of the gospel of Jesus of Nazareth is that God is really near. God's will is real and relevant. God is as accessible as your next prayer of thanks. Give thanks to God for the very breath in your nostrils and the pulse beat at your wrist. For God loves you. You are a son or daughter of the living God, a brother or a sister to every other person who walks this planet Earth. And if you will worship and love God and love every other human being and forgive and live in mercy, 
Your life and all things about it will become as new. There is something more to humankind than physical needs, anatomical structure, and cultural conventions. For there is a Godward groping in humankind as well, some secret soul-born certainty that somehow we were made for higher things than the things of earth, but for truth, for goodness, and for beauty, and for God ultimately. For we are sons and daughters of his, and brothers and sisters in the family of God. Thank God for that. Give worship, love, and praise for that. Let all your life reverberate with the great gladness of gratitude and great joy for God. In Mark chapter 7 of the J.B. Phillips translation, it is recorded, Now Jesus was approached by the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem. They had noticed that his disciples ate their meals with common hands, meaning that they had not gone through a ceremonial washing. So the Pharisees and the scribes put this question to Jesus, Why do your disciples refuse to follow the ancient tradition and eat their bread with common hands? And Jesus replied, You hypocrites, Isaiah described you beautifully when he wrote, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. You are so busy holding to the traditions of men, said Jesus, that you let go the very commandments of God. Jesus is stating religious custom, ritual, and ceremony are simply not enough. The Father God calls for a loyalty of inner heart and soul. This is true praise and worship. An animal will climb a mountain in search of food, but a human being will climb that mountain in search of a view. We'll climb a mountain just for the sheer beauty of it, for nothing else beyond that. For man does not live by food alone, nor by bread alone, as the master put it. A human being has higher yearnings in his or her soul for beauty, for truth and goodness, and for love, above all for love. And higher still even than that, is the hungering for God. These spiritual longings will not be denied. They must be satisfied only in faith, in prayer, in praise, and in worship. Can they thus be satisfied? There is something within you which needs to praise and worship God. You will never be fully satisfied as a human being until you have had that experience of aligning and synchronizing your mind, your will, your very existence with God and thanking God, losing yourself in the love of God, being overwhelmed with gratitude for your very existence, filled with the joy of existence as a free will mortal of this realm as a son or daughter of the deity. However rich a person may be, the corridors within him echo emptily as footsteps down cold marble halls, unless that man or woman has love for God and for others. What human has not known the hollow hurt of loneliness, the anguished void of lovelessness, that dark and gaping chasm deep within, that ceaseless yearning for true faith and hope and love and God, without these things, life is empty as an echo. But with them, your life will be fuller than your soul can hold. Give thanks, therefore, and love and worship of the living God. Pour out your soul in affection to the creator of all that is. You may say, I don't know how to worship. I don't know how to give thanks and praise. Doesn't one have to have a guidebook or a prayer book or a hymnal or something? No, just go stand on a hillside or in your closet or in your living room or in your bathroom or wherever you are and say, God, thank you. I love you. Pour out your soul. The terrible thing about being an atheist would be <laughs> to be happy and have no one to thank. Thank God for life itself and for the reality of God and God's great love for you and all this star-spangled universe. The British scholar J.B. Phillips has written, I remember during the war when I was working in a youth center in London, and we had a very exciting evening. There had been a concert and dancing and speeches and cheers and singing for He's a Jolly Good Fellow and all the rest of it. 
But then when it came to closing time, I suggested to the leaders that we should close, as we usually did, with prayers. But I think I must have used the word worship. Because one of them came up and said to me quite bluntly, you know, we don't have any idea what you mean when you say worship. Haven't you, I said? Well, let me explain it. It means three cheers for God. That's crude, of course, writes J.B. Phillips, but some of those young people saw for the first time what worship really meant, or at least so they told me afterwards. They had spent almost the whole evening clapping and cheering for people. Worship meant that they were going to acknowledge that God was the source of all that was jolly and friendly and cheering and lovable in human beings. Worship meant that they would give to God the power behind it all, the love and the admiration and the respect that they were so ready to bestow upon human beings. That says it beautifully. Praise and worship God. Give thanks to God. Your soul needs it. You need it in your inner heart. It will free the streams of your love and affection toward every other human being as well. William Jennings Bryan, the great orator, once said, Man is a religious being. The heart instinctively seeks for God, whether he worships on the banks of the Ganges, prays with his face upturned to the sun, kneels toward Mecca, or, regarding all space as a temple, communes with the Heavenly Father according to the creed of Christ. Man is essentially devout. The poet Bradley has written, Worship is a thirsty land crying out for rain, a candle in the act of being kindled. It is a voice in the night calling for help. It is a soul standing in awe before the mystery of the universe. It is time flowing into eternity. It is man climbing the altar stairs to God. Wrote Augustine, God is to be worshipped by faith and hope and love. And Richard Cabot has written, Worship renews the spirit as sleep renews the body. Worship God, love God, give thanks and praise to God, and all things will become as new to you. For God is closer than hands and feet, than heartbeat and breathing. His spirit indwells your mind. God has a plan for this planet and a purpose for your human life. Be you therefore perfect, said Jesus, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And the two great commandments were the love of God and the love of others. Thus live your life, and your life will be for you a living joy. Then write to us, will you? At the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, there's a reason for your life. And haven't you always felt it? Haven't you always really known it inside? There's a reason for your existence. God has a will for you. And I've written free literature on the spiritual life, on these very things, yours without cost, charge, or obligation, when you write to us at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, United States of America. I've written... Finding God, getting to know God, growing spiritually, seven principles of prayer, the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, life after death, what happens to you when you die, what lies beyond, all of this, yours with no cost, charge, or obligation when you write to us. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell out mailing address, Box 3080 Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program, Claiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.